Hello, everybody. Welcome to the URM podcast. My guest today is Scott Atkins, who is a producer best known for his work with bands such as Cradle of Filth and Silosis, among many others. We had a great conversation about building up your career, knowing when to spot opportunities, how to get really, really sick at audio, and the most important thing, dealing with the psychology of band members. And that's an interesting one because many of the things that we think only exist at the lower levels and stop happening once bands go pro, well, not only do they exist, but in lots of cases, they get worse. And knowing how to deal with those problems or issues or whatever you want to call them, idiosyncrasies, knowing how to deal with that, having a strategy and a plan for how to make sure things stay cool, well, that can be the difference between a career being a short-lived little blip or being lifelong. And that's what we get into. I introduce you, Scott Atkins. Scott Atkins, welcome to the URM podcast. Thank you very much. Glad to have you here. I'm I'm actually, I'm a fan of your work. And I want to ask you something that I used to ask people at the beginning of podcast episodes, but, um, I haven't thought about it much lately. And in a conversation that you and I had before this, it got me thinking about it. And so I'm wondering what made you want to start producing metal, like specifically metal? Yeah, I, I, I guess I did. I never really started out to, to want to do it. I, it kind of just happened. I played in a, in a, like a hardcore metal band. We formed in about 95. And almost very, very, very quickly, maybe within the first year or two, we got a deal. And immediately we were given money and it was like, go, go and record your songs. We went into the studio sort of every six months to a year doing two or three tracks. And every time it was not really quite hitting the mark for me. So I was frustrated as a band member because it I wasn't hearing what I wanted to hear at the speakers. You know, and I always felt like I could lean over the guy, you know, and no, no, it needs a little bit more of this, you know. And yeah, I, I guess it was just frustration, really. Um, and I, I'd never planned to do it. In fact, I was I was following a career in architecture at the time. And it wasn't until we were making our third album with Andy Sneap, and I'd, I'd mentioned that I'd been frustrated. And, and I always felt like I'd, I'd wanted to sort of be more involved. And he just said, you know, why don't you get a mobile rig together and or a small rig that you can move around because you haven't got any premises? And I was like, can it, is that possible? You know, I didn't even realize that was a thing because computer recording had just started mm. coming in. And he and he sent me some links and stuff over the internet. It's like you could get one of these, you could get this and flight case it. And I thought maybe you know and i thought well if in a year i want to do this maybe i'll do it then and a year came by and you know the band had been on tour and stuff and yeah i decided to buy the gear and that was it really in the late 90s i know that he used to travel around and mobile record people i believe he did one a a testament record that way recording Mm -hmm. in their rehearsal space like mm-hmm. i'm almost yeah. positive that, that he did that i forget which one but in the late 90s could be wrong yeah probably the gathering yeah i'm Maybe like 99.9 percent positive that he did that in the late 90s and um you know that's very very forward thinking to be able to mobile mm. record but one thing that i think is really cool which i've noticed is People that are that good, like Andy, aren't going to feel threatened by someone getting in the game. So they they yeah, will say, "Why don't you just right. Why don't you just try it?" As opposed to I've been around people and I've heard of people who you know the band member says that they're thinking about doing it or mm-hmm. you know expressing something where the logical conclusion is you should do it, yeah, yeah. and they'll try to discourage them. And I just I think. It's interesting that when you're around people that are truly great, like Andy, there's no reason for them to ever feel threatened by it. And so they usually tend to be very helpful. 
Yeah, and he and he went way beyond that. I mean, I, I got my rig together, and he and he said, "Why didn't you bring it up to the studio, and we'll mic up the kit, and I'll show you how to like do some basic stuff." You know, and the first band I'd recorded, I I I took the session, and he showed me how to arrange it, and you know, put samples in and things. You know, he, he didn't need to do any of that. No, there was nothing in it for him. But I I think he probably saw me as a as somebody who was in a similar role as he was in his band, you know, so, so we, we had a very sort of similar, you know, organizational role within our bands. We, we all were struggling against the tide a bit. I felt like we'd been in similar sh- shoes really. So it, it, when he wanted, wanted to help me, he knew it, he knew it was because I was genuinely interested and in doing it for the right reasons, you know, to help bands rather than it being for my own ends really. What do you think is a more realistic career? Uh, architecture, the way that you were pursuing it, or what you ended up doing? Like if you had if you had a kid that was choosing one or the other, <laughs> which one would you say was the safer bet if you were advising your kid? Oh, definitely the architecture. Yeah, definitely. I think, you know, I mean, trying to make it as a producer or, it, or even, I mean, if you could say making it was making a living out of it and not having to work elsewhere would, in my mind, would be making it in music, really. And I think, you know, you, there's no guarantee of getting paid, is there? Obviously, you know, the dream would be to get bigger bands and do great Metallica or Slayer or, you know, that, that, of that ilk. But for me, it was, if I can carry on month by month making making it work, then I've won really. Cause you know, the time I want, I was making the transition from architecture, the band was that I'd been in, you know, we were a real underdog band. We never made any money or became like largely successful, but we just wanted to do it. You know, we didn't, we didn't set out to be a big band. So it was really the same mindset of, well, we've worked really hard on this. It got so far along. I'm going to try this now and and try and do a studio and, you know, and if I can keep doing it and managing to eat and pay the bills, then great. I do think that the idea of getting to the Metallica level is, I mean, it's great to have huge goals, Mm. but it's also, this is going to sound contradictory because I definitely believe in thinking big, but it's really, really unhealthy, I think, in terms of getting, of actually accomplishing things to set your sights on bands like Metallica only for the numbers. There's like mm. one Metallica. So yeah. there's literally one person every few years who's going to be able to work on them out of out of everybody who works on bands. And it, I mean, it's cool to to dream about that but it's not a, it's not very founded in reality of actually having a production career there's yeah. a whole industry out there of people who do you know not so well all the way to very well who don't work with metallicas and i, I think that you're absolutely right that because there is no security whatsoever in it mm. that actually carving an existence like a good existence a respectable existence out of it is winning 100 percent. super rare actually yeah i agree and as i got a lot older and the and the years started to go past in doing the doing the studio they it's weird like there's a safety net of of a certain age where you think well this is this came to an end. If it only lasted five years, then I could go and study something else or go back to to architecture. And I'm I'm 50 now, and I think, oh, you know, the, the road's run out for a, a potential career change. If it all went tits tomorrow, you know, you're kind of in a vulnerable position. I think, well, what else would I do? And I think really, you know, the plan B sort of gets left behind. When I started the studio, I never expected to be doing it this many years later on you know i started it in 2005 and it was only ever a short-term thing you know maybe i'll be doing it in a year or two years it's two less years i'll be you know in an office 
which is a win. Um, but you know, that's nearly 18 years ago. So yeah. yeah. It, the thing though, <laughs> the older you do get, the harder it is to change gears. And mm. I, and I do think that the longer you keep a plan B, the more uh, damaging it is because Can be, yeah. it, it's damaging because exactly what you just said about, okay, so you get to 50, you, you've been doing this. What if it all goes to shit? Then what? Career mm. change? That's crazy. And so it, you got to make the plan A so strong that it's not going to, it's not going to go to shit. Uh, basically, it has to be about survival, in my opinion. Mm. It, it, yeah. I feel like humans are not motivated by good things. They're motivated by bad things. Um, they're motivated mm. by fear or fear. motivated by the worst possible outcome. And I think just keeping in mind that it's a house of cards, I think keeping that firmly in the center of someone's mind should be really, really good fuel for doing what needs to be done. Mm-hmm. As it has been for yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I think there's, there is a flip side to it as well. I mean, I, I've always worked as hard as possible and conscientiously as well. You know, I always want to do right by the bands. I, I understand how desperate they are to sort of make their next record the one that, you know, makes a difference mm-hmm. to their career. And there has to be some balance. You know, my, my advice to anyone who's, who's listening to this who uh, wants to make it or at least make a go of doing production is you have to manage your, your workload and the way you work in a way which enables you to carry on doing it in the long term. About seven years ago, I had a, I had a bit of a wobble uh, where I like, started getting chest pains and dizzy spells. And I went to the doctor's. And, uh, and he said, um, you know, what do you do for a living? I sort of run a music studio and stuff. And he was like, right, okay. You know, what sort of hours are you doing? And I was like, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and, he, and he, he was like, do you love doing it? And I said, yeah. He said, do you want to keep doing it? And I said, yeah, 100%. And he said, you need to just work more sensibly with a better work-life balance which is not something I was doing, you know, I'd start at 10 in the morning and three or four in the morning and I'd still be, you know, nearly 24 hours later. And it's amazing the drive that you'll find when you really invested in a project and you want it to be amazing. And you, you know, you're up against the time and the band are sort of going to put everything into it, but you got to remember a band is only making one album every sort of couple of years, but you're making an album one after another, you know? So their effort level is they're fresh, aren't they? But you're 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 not going to be as fresh as them. So you you're you're trying to accommodate and match their energy level and make the project as good as possible. But ultimately you're going to get burnout, which is what I had. Yeah, not not just what you're saying, but also there's nobody in the band who's going to be working on it every single day like you right so yeah, collectively exactly. collectively they might have a crazy amount of energy but you know the drummer is going to do their parts and then they're done you need yeah. to keep going so mm-hmm. pacing yourself just within the scope of one project forget all the other ones just to get through the one project i think matters a lot that you pace yourself mm-hmm. properly yeah for sure and it's Everything, you know, your whole life can go out the window because you want to get the, you know, especially if you're mixing. It's like you might have an engagement or something with your, with your girlfriend or a family thing or, you know, you're going to go out with all your mates. It's easy to suck it all off when your mix isn't quite getting there and the mastering's booked or you're doing the mastering or the deadline's tomorrow or the next day or maybe next week and you start plowing the hours in. It, it can really get the better of you. So, you know, key to longevity for me, really, and sort of moving forwards is try and allow yourself that sort of time where you get to recharge, you know, try to just be a bit more sensible about it. So what does that mean on like a day-to-day level? What does 
being more sensible mean? What does it actually look like? I try and do sort of a 10 hour day rather than sort of 24. Try and take time at weekends as much as possible, you know, especially if you've got kids or a, or a girlfriend. And I'd say like music production is a classic sort of accommodating role where you're always going to try and meet the demands of the band and the client. They're like biking dogs. They're always going to want as much as you can give them, you know, especially if you're on a budget, if you're on a fixed budget for an album, if they can get, you know, extra weeks out of you in time during the same period, you know, they're winning, aren't they? And it's not, it's not malicious. They, they just, no, no, of course they it's just not. want their, the best for their record. Yeah. I mean, it's great. We're making heavy metal, aren't we? It's brilliant. Yeah. Um, but you know, there comes a time when you can't keep doing that. And I think a lot of studios fail or people exit the business purely for that. You get, you know, they're sick of it or, you know, overworked, you know, managing it badly. So how do you, how do you handle that? without pissing the bands off. And I'm asking because I remember when I was producing bands that this was this was a problem for me in dealing with bands, the trying to pace myself when they mm. uh, don't want to pace themselves and expect me not to pace myself, then I would feel guilty about it or mm -hmm. feel like I was mm -hmm. doing something wrong yeah. and I could... I don't know if it was imagined or real, but then I think that they were unhappy uh, and then this negative spiral. So I guess what I'm wondering is how do you approach that with the bands so that it all stays cool while still respecting their, you know, their ambition and their drive? Yeah, and that is that is a, a killer question, really. And I and I'm sure lots of people listening will will be interested in that because the spiral you're describing is in the past for me, a reason that I've thought about shutting the studio down and getting out, you know, in maybe in the first decade when I was sort of finding my feet and dealing with bands for me nowadays, I'm just upfront about it. You know, I just say, right, these are the hours you work around that, you know, if you've got accommodation or you want to plan your meals and, you know, they're all staying together and stuff, you know, this is what we're doing. It's funny because since I've been working like that as well, everybody knows where they are, where in the past we've started work in the morning and we had no idea what time we were going to finish. And some people aren't cut out for it in the band and they're not really going to say, oh, it's getting on a bit, you know, like no one wants to say that. They, they might be really tired or they're hungry, you know, nobody stopped to eat. Everyone gets knackered. And, you know, things can go a bit wayward. You can come in the next day and it's like, mm, those solos we did last night, they weren't really cutting it. What were we thinking? Three in the morning. <laughs> yeah. So nowadays, you know, everybody knows what time to start, what time we're finishing. It's heads down, hard graft. We're done. That's it. Go our separate ways. Maybe we'll go for dinner. That's it. There's a lot of studies about this subject, about I'm actually reading a book called Deep Work right now. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I've I've studied and thought about a lot and looked at what other people have to say about it. But there's a lot of thinking about the idea that both willpower and creativity are finite resources. Um, and oh, yeah. it, it's it, some people think that Willpower is not a finite resource, but just that it's finite towards one thing. So you can some there's one school of thought that is that says that you can have as much willpower as you want throughout the day as long as you keep changing your focus. And then there's other people who think that uh, willpower is a finite resource that you recharge when you go to sleep. But the point is that the leading thinkers all think that no matter what, you're not going to be able to do the same thing indefinitely without losing steam. And so mm. knowing that it, it's important to structure structure the day, in my opinion, to where uh, the best hours are spent working and then you're not trying to do that important work once you're, once you're past your ability to do the best important work. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's totally true. I mean, everybody, you know, drummers and vocalists, especially, they're not gonna they they don't have 10, 12 hours in them. No. Generally, you know, obviously, you know, so but they might want to have, no, no, I could do yes. more, I can do more. And you're like, you know what? Earlier on, the snares were in the red clipping, like, you know, and now like we're barely halfway up the meter. No, no, I can hit harder. I was like, you're going to injure yourself. You know, no one wants to hear, you know, you passed your best. It's a weird, it's a weird thing. It is. And also think about who you're dealing with, right? So you're dealing with a metal drummer who's really great. Think about the personality type it takes to become a great metal drummer. Mm. It's almost like being a top athlete combined yeah, with it is. combined with being like a mathematical thinker. It's it's a weird, it's a weird, highly charged uh, personality type. And so that thing that gets them to be a great drummer is that same thing that mm. is going to make them not want to stop. And it, I mean, that's kind of why you've been hired to lead lead the way. Yeah, I I, I do think it's. Unfortunately, it's it's something that is really common with drummers, and almost all the injuries I've ever seen a drummer really get it's it's at the end of a session when they've lost that sort of real focus and that mm-hmm. control, and it could be something stupid, you know, they 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 catch the edge of the cymbal on the on the knuckles or something, or you know, they 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 sprain the forearm muscle during the ride or something, and the next day they can't play. We stopped two hours earlier when I said you've got 10 hours more drumming today or, you know, a whole day or whatever it is. So, yeah, there's been lots of I told you so's. <laughs> yeah. But no it, one wants to hear that, do they? <laughs> no. So how do you, so let me understand what you're saying. So it all works better for you now that you're just up front about it and set the boundaries clearly going in. Yeah, because I, I just think too many bands have seen the Black Album. You know, it's in the middle of the night. You know, everyone's having such a great time because it's four in the morning, and they want they think that's part of the part of the dream. You know, especially the 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 younger bands, the ones who sort of haven't really sort of set off down the down the road that's sort of taken all the all the fun out of it <laughs> and ruined ruined the dream. You know, they they. You know they're eager, and it's great to have young bands in who who don't have studio experience. But they're the ones who, more so than the you know the band on their fifteenth album, are wanting to be a in the studio all night. And the thing with those documentaries too is, like Black Album one, that was a nine month process condensed into a two hour video. Yeah. So yeah, you're not you didn't really see the actual session just seeing some funny clips out of nine months so Mm -hmm. there's no way to actually know what their schedule really was whether or not you're seeing like you know the once in a while nights or just the once in a blue moon Mm -hmm. like that's super unclear in that documentary in particular they did a really great job editing it to make it seem a certain way but I'm sure reality is very different than what's portrayed on that video. Oh yeah, cool. I mean, definitely, yeah. But it does it doesn't change the fact that you know bands buy into that sort of romantic, yes. sort of relationship with the with the with the studio and doing all the hours. And I think another problem is most bands have jobs. They're on a finite window. They've booked it off work or whatever, you know, and course they haven't rehearsed their parts properly and they you know they had some of the some of the parts they've never played before because they no bands rehearse anymore so like you know they're all coming in they're like oh you've got the tab for the parts and you know like, i'm like hey those those days she's a couple of work you need to double them and then the pressure's on me isn't it it's like oh do i have to do a couple of more extra hours here because you can't get any more time off work um you know that stuff never goes away you know and some some of the more established bands, you know, everybody's busy. Even if you're in a professional touring band, when they're not on tour, they're doing stuff. So then they've got to get time away from that. So it doesn't matter whether it's that or a job. The time that they've allowed to come into the studio, they want to get it all done. But there's often not enough preparation done. 
So, yeah. What do you do? Is it me? What do you do to not let yourself... um, Those are... Okay, so these things that you're talking about are the things that help people get jaded and then exit the business or Mm -hmm. kind of develop a reputation for being hard to be around but those things that you're talking about are just the reality of of the game at this point of bands not coming in super prepared of time being a weird factor how do you approach those things i get ahead of it okay i if so when a band sort of says we want to come in make the records next april say i'm like right i want a full set of demos maybe 20 songs we can pick the best songs and work on the songs and stuff you know on the dropbox or via email and stuff like that you know so i know they've written the songs because some bands turn up and haven't written any songs or yep <laughs> songs um you know so i get ahead of it like that you know i can be upfront about the amount of time available i can give him a sh- schedule you know the, the main person i'm dealing with on the internet and in the band right here's the schedule make sure everybody's up to spec if there's two guitarists, they need to be rehearsing together or on Skype one-on-one, playing the riffs the same. So there's lots of things you can sort of plan to ensure that when they turn up, we all know what we're doing. These are the songs we're recording. You know all the parts. I know you can play them all. Preferably, I can get a rehearsal tape uh, recording You know, on the phone under a jacket or something. It doesn't need to be anything special. I can just hear that the band have played the songs and they've checked like the tempos are good and the guitarists program drums are playable by the drummer. Um, <laughs> you know, all those, all those stumbling blocks that if you don't say anything about it in advance, it just gets swept under the carpet. And then day one, Oh yeah, we've only got seven songs, but we're going to write three more, you know, and all the, all the stuff you know that you've heard before from other bands starts to come out. Yeah, I feel like lots of times with producers who get over frustrated with that stuff, that's kind of their fault for not yeah. taking ownership of the project early on. There's always going to be surprises, right? But I think that if it's happening over and over, then the question for that I have is if you know that this is happening over and over, why are you not, why are you not dealing with it ahead of time? Yeah. Like what, like yeah. what are you yeah. doing to, to make sure it doesn't happen or to minimize it? Someone has got to do the job, haven't they? You know, it's, it's got to be somebody within the band who's running a tight ship, like a Dave Mustaine type, or it's got to be me. So I'm always sort of really on it in, in the run up. Especially with the songwriting, you know, I, 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 it really pains me when a band's written four or five good songs and then you know that the other five are just sl- slung together, um, no way near as good. And, and I can spot it and I, and I say, look, come on, these five are really good, but these five, they're not really cutting it. And you can get them upgraded very, very quickly and quite easily, to be honest as long as it's flagged up early on, you know, I was say, have a chat with the guy, see what they think. And then it, the, the email comes back. Yeah. They've all said yeah, they don't really like the songs either. It's like, this is your album. You're planning on, you know, getting your band to the next level. Come on, let's get serious about what's, what we're doing. Sometimes or lots of times you just need someone outside to, point something out i mean that's the whole reason that coaches exist and yeah you know mentors or bosses or leaders is just because stuff like that where they might know that out of the 10 songs five are good five are eh, not so good but for whatever reason it's not like they're okay with bad songs but they might not be fully internalizing how far off those songs are or, Mm. you know, they, they might have just kind of like accepted it for whatever reason and just not thought about it too much. Oftentimes it just takes somebody to 
point out what they already know is true. Usually that's the case. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. And especially if, if uh, somebody is quite a prolific writer, like say say Josh Middleton, for instance, uh, Silosis, he's, he can churn it out. I mean, to a good standard as well. He's like, I'll put all the demos in the Dropbox and there's loads of it. And you think, you know, fair play. He's a, you know, he, he's a machine when it comes to writing. Um, he just needs, a, you know, another set of ears. And it, it's not even like you need to make suggestions about the material. You can say, I think you're repeating yourself a bit there or this this is, seems a bit not not really suiting for the band or this song doesn't seem to have a chorus. Someone like him can take it on board. He can digest what you've written or we have a Skype meeting or whatever. And then all of a sudden, everything's gone up another 15% in a week. And it's just having, it's, it's giving him the ability to sort of have a fresh perspective on what he's written. You know, it's almost like, you know, you've got a bit of tunnel vision and then you've helped widen the way he's looking at his material. Um, so yeah, I just, I mean, as a producer, that's kind of what you want to bring to the party really, isn't it? A band have written some songs and you can say these ones aren't as good as these ones. These ones, they really sound like you grown up a bit from your last record and try and get them to look at it uh, like that, really. And maybe that's what Rick Rubin did with Metallica. You know, I mean, they they made a big deal about him getting them to look backwards, but like not try and copy what they've done in the past, but sort of have a, a new perspective on on what it is they're trying to achieve and and what they've written. Yeah, so whenever a band sends me stuff, like 10, 15 tracks, and they're going to record an album, it's it's great to be able to say, these are the weak ones, these are the strong ones, we need a bit more of this. It's very mid-tempo, how about a few fast ones? You know, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, we, we really think about that. It gets the project moving, gets everyone towing the line, so when they come into the studio, we're... We all know what we're going to be doing. Yeah, man, I can tell you from my perspective as an artist that lots of times when collaborating with someone, what I'm really looking for is them to just say that thing that that like helps the light bulb turn on for me. Mm. Krim is a drummer in my band and lots of times I'll send him songs and he will he will tell me like within a song where there's too much of something or we need to take it in this direction here because it's just too much of one mm. thing or, you know, whatever it is. And oftentimes just getting that is enough to help me see the way forward. I think mm. lots of times when you're writing, you know, it's tough to get a bird's eye view on it just because you're right there in it. Even if the answer is super obvious to someone who does have a bird's eye view, if you're right there on the ground, you know, it can be unclear sometimes and you just need that person to point out the, you're all the songs are kind of between 170 and 185 BPM. Like yeah, you've got yeah. eight songs in that range in four, four, like, uh, is it supposed to be that way or, or what, mm. Mm. you know? And then like I remember I was told on the last Doth record, man, you got a lot of songs at around 200. Like, you know, there's a song at 207, a song at 195, a song at 202. Like, they're all kind of living in that range. Is that what you want? Like, because they're good, but like, is that what you want? An album that's all like in that range or not? And it's like, you're right. Ooh. I'm just writing. I'm just writing and getting into it. And yeah. that's kind of what I'm naturally doing. So it takes someone saying that for me to say, oh, okay, I need to, all right, let's just put the click at 130 and see what happens and go from there. And it's just hard sometimes to to think of those solutions without having a partner help you. That's why I think collaboration is so essential. Um, I actually think that the idea of the lone operator in music is a myth just about always it's a myth like you hear these stories about the Trent Reznor's 
or whatnot. And that that's like a that's like a nice story, but it's not the mm-hmm. truth. Like even Trent Reznor has always had a partner. And any of these great solo artists or even a Dave Mustaine type, like, well, they're always working with great people. So it's even if they yeah, are yeah. the leader, they're always working with great people. And I just I just don't buy that people can do this alone. And so knowing that that's important, I think that it's also on the artist to go to find who they trust and Ooh. ask them for uh, that collaborative insight. But, you know, as a producer, I think that that's one of the most important things you can bring to a project. Yeah, definitely. And I I do worry about metal, uh, actually, because I think, you know, there's, there's lots of really great software tours now where you kind of don't need the bassist or the drummer especially if you're a guitarist um you can put a, a, a basic demo package together on your laptop it can be a bands can become a one-man band looks like a band to the average punter you know there's a band in the photo and everything but actually there's a mega mind one member who's controlling everything telling everybody what to play and then obviously at some point the album's made, but nobody really knows that it's not not that. a band. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's not a band. There's no accidental riff writing, you know, in the rehearsal room. It's like, oh what what were you playing there? And it's like, oh, this. It's like, yeah, that's amazing, you know, and they all start jamming in and it's amazing. But there's ways so you know that's is that old school? I don't know. I know I know things have moved yes on, but yes surely. And, yes and no. It's old school, yes. That's but the, a great thing. Yes and no. So, like, I agree with you. But then also the idea that bands will get back into the rehearsal space, I think that's wishful thinking, just because the reality mm. is that so many bands are not geographically together like they used to be. So in the old days, yeah, yeah. bands formed based on who was around them. But that's not mm-hmm. that's not a thing anymore. Like if you my band right now, two members are in Austria. I'm in Milwaukee. One person's in Austin, Texas. Another person's in Atlanta. Another person's in Boston. So it could very easily go in that direction you're talking about, where I just write every single thing and I tell everybody what to play. And I know there's lots mm-hmm. of bands like that. So knowing that, I think you have to try. You have to try to get the those accidental riffs, or you have to make more of an effort to uh, to have it be more of a band album or a band creation, mm. because it could super easily go into the w- one man the one man show. And I think that it usually won't be as good as it could be. But the idea of a band getting back in the rehearsal space, like I just don't. I just don't think that that's reality just because of the way that bands are these days, man. Like Metal Blade was telling me the other day, because we're trying to plan music videos, that it's now the norm for them to be arranging for photo shoots and music videos for the bands on the label to everything for the album to be done in one felt swoop because nobody lives in the same town let alone the same country anymore. That's the norm yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. The same, it's the same for Cradle. You know, they keyboardist, guitarist in in uh, Arizona or around now, uh, drummer, guitarist in Czech Republic, Danny in, in England, bassist in Scotland. So, yeah, same thing. But, you know, videos, we need all the photo shoot doing. What else can we do whilst everybody's flown in? everything's got to be coordinated to that. I mean, you know, it, maybe it's always going to be like that because you can hand pick from anywhere in the world, the perfect member for your band where like in the eighties, that was just impossible. You yeah, know, man, it was, it, well, I was, I was doing it in the nineties, but like it was, it was rough. Even in the two thousands, it was rough, man. Trying to find great members. Mm. Now it's still hard, but you can, I can go to across the world and find the perfect lead guitar player for the project. But I do think that 
with that, there's new challenges and it, it's important to realize that and then to like work in, work it into the writing process to where you can like circumvent the, lim- the limitations, I guess, mm, to make yeah. more of an effort to be more collaborative. Yeah, for sure. I, and I wonder, you know, like, because you're not a gang, you almost have to make effort in different ways to sort of keep the lineup together, I guess. Because, like, back back when I did my band, we all lived within 20 miles of each other. Mm-hmm. So rehearsal was sort of a social gathering, like, yeah. hang out, talked about movies and, like, new albums and stuff. You know, we'd sit in the car and listen to new stuff when we were having a break or go to the pub, have a few drinks. Um, yeah, we were like a gang, really, and and that was like the the core of the of the band. It was it was really about that, and the band being a band was secondary, you know, because we were good friends. We we were all into the same stuff, so we were always together. Like they worked hand in hand, if you know what I mean. It was like we we're we we're a, a gang, a band that played music together. So when we were on tour and stuff, it was just an extension of that. Where I guess if you get people that you don't know into your band from different countries, you've got to be very lucky, I guess, to to get that on the roads. Yeah. I mean, I've never met some of the people in my band. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's it's a strange one, isn't it? It is because it, the way that you're describing the band is the way that I kind of grew up too, is mm. you guys against the world. Yeah. And even though like even though for me it was always just music and band first, still it was still very much a social thing and very much like a brotherhood thing, and very much mm-hmm. like uh like this was your squad. Yeah. And that was really important to me. It's a lot tougher, but I wonder also, is that also just part of being twenty years old or twenty five years old? Probably, yeah. I, I I do think if, you know, I was looking back over the sort of, back to when I started the studio and I was in my really early 30s then and I, I'd, we'd already done 10 years of sort of transit van, like not even seats in a minibus. It was on the, on the plywood in the back, in the dark, driving thousands of miles around Europe as a, you know, as a load of lads with all the gear and it was like, yeah, no, we're going to, you know, we're going to take over the world. And, you know, it was us against the world basically. And at the end of, of the band, I, I had, I was pretty sick of doing it to be honest. And I would never form a band now and, and, and go back to that. So yeah, part, part of it is the age, but saying that when I started the studio with a mobile rig, it, it really was, very similar to to how it was when it started the band. So I was sleeping on the floor in the rehearsal rooms or like crashing at people's houses on the floor in sleeping bags, you know, lumping gear uh, in the car. You know, the mobile rig was, it wasn't tiny, but it was, it was, it filled all the seats, including the passenger seat in the front. Yeah. So if I'd started the studio any later, I, I just don't think I would have started it like that. Makes you know, sense. A, a year of that was draining. Yeah. It was, <laughs> It was tough, you know, but if somebody hadn't been in a band doing something like that would probably seem quite, quite alien. I think, you know, to, to, to sort of start hanging out with bands in that capacity, you know, I was so used to it that it just, it was just an extension of what I'd already been doing. Yeah. I, I, there's a lot of benefit, I think, to having done it yourself, mm. you know, easier for everything to be relatable, easier to communicate, I think. Um, I'm curious about your work with Cradle of Filth, actually. Um, mm-hmm. Just to change topics, you uh, you've been working with them for a while. It's a band that's mm-hmm. been around forever. They've had ups and downs. Like they've been one of the most popular bands on earth to where their popularity started to fade. Then they've come back. Like they they've had quite the career. Several iconic lineups. Like it's. They're kind of basically everything you can think of that a successful metal band would have uh, experienced. They've probably experienced at some point. Yeah. And yet you've been working with them a lot, a long time. 
And yeah, long time. Yeah. So what I'm curious about is how have you approached, I guess, keeping the relationship going through all their changes? Like, how have you stayed right there with them? Um, because lots of times what happens when a band goes through changes is one of the first things to go is the producer, especially if yeah. they've been working with the yeah. producer for a while. I think I think it's down to my relationship with Danny, to be honest. I just think it's just, we're just mates, really. And there's a trust issue there, or a trust element there that's, you know, we just, we see eye to eye on almost everything, uh, uh, you know, to do with the band, the songs. We don't really have a clash of opinion. So if I say this is, needs to be better, he's like, yeah, yeah, I agree, hundred percent. You know, so we tend to sort of get things lifted up, and and it's also quite difficult to organise the band members because obviously it goes back to the internet and and everything. So I think we just have a shared vision of where we see the band, and then we the the conversations we have are all are usually about sort of getting everything for the next project or whatever to sort of toe that line and then sort of saying the right things to the band members to get the songs written in a certain way. So it really, yeah, it really starts with the relationship that I have with Dan and where we see the band going next. Um, Dan lives very close to me, like 15 minute drive. So it's, it's easy for us to stay in touch. We can see each other. Uh, he can come, just come to the studio and it's, it's easy for us to put a plan together. So, you know, if there's a new album in the works, we can go through the Dropbox together and figure out where we want to take the band, really. So even if you change guitarists or keyboard player or whatever, the consistent thing is that me and Dan are sort of working together in a in a way which is sort of solid and it's well thought out, you know, for what's going to come next. But that's the thing that is interesting about Cradle of Filth and lots of bands where they've gone through lineup changes is when a band go through, goes through lineup changes and also they have a long career to go through different evolutions, but yet they still sound like that band. That's always mm. interesting because, you know, from lots of times fans associate like when a member leaves a band fans will get sad about it but then the next album still sounds like that band mm. and i wonder if fans think about why that is is it like because kind of like with you brought up the Dave mustaine example it's like okay so to me what that means is it's super clear that the and I'm sure this is clear to everybody, but like the Megadeth universe, like he is the center of the Megadeth universe and the artistic mm -hmm. vision. And he always has been, and he's always had great people to help uh, fulfill that vision. But even without them, that vision is his, it's his. And it's, and that's why every Megadeth album sounds like Megadeth. It's why mm -hmm. every Cradle of Filth album sounds like Cradle of Filth regardless of who's in the band and regardless of what what direction it's going in. Yeah. I mean, you could definitely credit Danny as the musical director. He's just very good at getting people to see like the overall sort of picture of the back catalogue. And obviously it's there for anyone to hear who joins the band. They can get a flavour. It's easy to say, we want it to be a bit more like this album this time. You know, if you needed to pinpoint it down for a, a style. But also, like, the, the guys will write a lot of material. So he, Dan's good at selecting what he likes from the submissions as well. Because he, he knows the sound uh, that he, that represents the band so well. He's like, that's not us, that's not us. So like, immediately that stuff's sort of taken off the table. That's not to say, you know, you, you want to move the the sound forwards that some some stuff would still be considered, but maybe I'll bring that ear a little bit and say, well, I, we've done a lot of that already. Maybe we need to go a bit this way. And he's like, oh yeah, maybe. I, I do think when, once Dan is on, on a track, 
it immediately sounds like Cradle of Filth. And there's a certain sound to like Cradle Cradle keyboards that, you know, as soon as they're on as well, you know, from from building a mix from from the kick upwards, there's certain stages where it suddenly sounds like Cradle of Filth more than it would have done if it hadn't been sort of directed by Dan, if you know what I mean. Yeah, you know. Quite hard to explain. Well, they have signature elements. So I yeah. think part yeah. of your job is to make sure that those signature elements are, you know, doing their job. I, I think lots of times, I'm curious your experience with this. Lots of times, and I hear this from artists, they have problems with mixers because even if the mixer is a great mixer and they give them a quote unquote great mix, oftentimes they'll it'll be wrong in that whatever the signature element is that matters the most, that'll get overlooked or buried. And that's like this common complaint I hear from mm. artists. And I've had that complaint too. And when you have something like Cradle of Filth, where first of all, it's a, got a specific sound. Second of all, it's got non-traditional arrangements to where orchestra or keyboards and metal that's some tough shit to mix and mm. i think that the instinct initially for any metal mixer is to just turn that stuff down just because mm. sonically it's you know you're fighting guitars the whole time and so the instinct is always to turn that stuff down so what i'm wondering for you is when you do get an artist with very specific sound in non-traditional arrangements. Um, are you looking to the artist to direct you at all? Or like, how do you make sure that you understand exactly, not just what it needs to be to sound proper, but like to sound like them? That is the holy grail though, of, of being a good mixer. And it's, I, I'd struggle with it. Maybe not so much a cradle, but imagine I've sent off the masters. I've just finished a cradle album, and then I've got another album to mix by someone else. And it's like I could make it sound like them, be you know to cobble the mix together quickly, or you've got to dig really deep. It's like what what does the band need to sound like? You know what what is it that you are going to latch onto? Sneep's amazing at it. You know, he can work with Priest and it sounds like Priest. He knows what priests need. Testament, it's he it brings out the band. And that's what I've learned from Andy is what is the band about? What are you trying to say with the mix? You know, it's it's so hard to explain. But it is like sculpting their identity more into the sound. It's like a guitar tone. Like you sit with a guitarist and you need to know what the band sounds like to get the tone. Mm. You can't just choose any tone for the, just because the guitarist likes it. You know, it's, you've got to be thinking about the band. I, I worked with Andy on a Monomath about 10 years ago and they've got a really specific tone, you know, but it's all based around how, how deep and, low the, the singer's voice is, right? So everything, like they're in A and it's really robust and thick and heavy. And, I, yeah, I saw Andy work the tone for the projects and it was really, it was so interesting because it comes down to that, like fitting the sounds and the, the style of the band and, you know, you'd be thinking about the logo and the way they look and everything is their sound, you know? And when you mix for it, it it needs to tie together, doesn't it? You can't just have any mix. You know, you, you if you tried to put like a hate breed mix on Cradle, it's, it just wouldn't work, would it? It's terrible. No, it wouldn't work at all. Um, <laughs> do you think that that requires understanding the back catalogue at all? Yeah, I do. I do think you need to do research. I I do research for bands. There's a band I, I work with called Benediction. They've been around for oh, yeah. in, in the UK. And um, they they did an album called Grind Bastard in the uh, sort of mid-90s. It was kind of like held as their best record. 
and it is a great record. It's got a real sound. But then they they made a couple of albums since with like different people and cobbled it together with a different singer and it they totally lost the sound. And then I did an album with them and we I wanted to go back to that sound. So I had to really research that stage of their career and you know what makes them sound like that on that record and try and sort of reverse engineer it because that's what they wanted as well you know they were like that's when we were there you know sounding our best that side of our identity is on that record we need that blueprint on this record um so yeah you definitely need to do the research it's not just drum sounds it's guitar sounds and like obviously, if you're mixing, you, you you want to get rid of bad frequencies and things and get everything clear as possible. But I find with a band like them is is if you go too far with that sort of stuff, it doesn't sound like them as much. So you need some stuff that you'd rather take out left in. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, but exactly what that is that I think that's the that's the art, I guess. Yeah, well, it could be like you know, it could be like they they need loads of 4K in their guitars, but you but everybody takes it out, but they need it. You know, it's like, there's just different rules. It's like obituary. Who would choose that tone? No one. But it sounds sick with them. But it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing for them. I think that that requires not being bound by, I guess, both habits and rules. Mm. Because uh, what I've noticed, at least through observing URM students and then also just knowing that I've gone into these traps too, is you think that there's a way of doing things. And the more, the better you get, the more you solidify how to do things. And those things that we're talking about now that give an artist their identity, usually those are outside of the proper way of doing things. It's like mm. places where you have to bend rules or just do things outside of the box. And it's hard to, uh, it's hard to just do that. I think that you have to be, you like, you have to overcome that human need to do the same thing every time. Yeah. It's so difficult though, especially if you're up against the clock. You know what works, right? You you know that if you use this plugin with this EQ on it for bass, it's always going to sound good. Mm -hmm. Those drum samples that you've used before, you've already got like EQs and stuff dialed in for those. You could just throw those in. That would be all right. This guitar sounds a good tone, so we could just use that. But that isn't necessarily going to be right for the band, is it? I'd say the, the hardest time... That I have when I'm sort of trying to fit sounds to bands is when I do, when the band has got no discography at all, like they're a new band or they're a local band and they're all you know they're starting their journey. You kind of have to grill them. Like I'll be setting the drum kit up and setting the mics up and the stands, and I'll be talking to the band like the whole time about what they grew up on, where they see the band going, what sort of bands would they would be good to tour with. Where do they see the band? You know, because not necessarily all the members in the band would share the vision. So you kind of, I mean, I've got to get an idea from somewhere. So you kind of have to sort of do some homework, whether it's discography or through the band members. Because if you don't do that, what, like, then you're kind of inventing their sound for them. Yeah. And that's based on what? It's got to be based on something, isn't it? Yeah. If somebody in the band who wrote all the songs is really into Alex Cooper, that might be enough to... It would, it would certainly give you some idea of where he's coming from, maybe, you know. So it's kind of like being a detective. Pretty much, yeah. It is. Have you ever encountered young bands who don't have any vision whatsoever and they just want you to give it to them? Mm, yeah, a little bit. Yeah, th there's an English band who's sort of doing quite well now. They're called South of Salem. I, I did their debut, and Ramesh has just done their new album, and it still sounds like them to me. It's different because he's done it, and he he works very differently to I, what I would do. And obviously, he's he's very good at making hit records as well. But when I heard it, I could still hear them in it. So. 
they're they're obviously bringing something because they weren't that vocal about well, how they wanted to sound to me. That was quite a tricky one. So the sound I gave them, I don't know whether he's gone off that, but that was a, a weird one because they they've only just released a couple of tracks and I heard it because I, I couldn't wait to hear it and. It sounds amazing, but it still sounds like them. I guess at the end of the day, like being vocal is good, but some people don't know how to be vocal about those things. And I think that that makes it even harder for a producer. If the band is not very vocal, then you have to analyze it even harder um, or just trust your instincts. But lots of times, lots of times I think bands or musicians even mixers, they just get their sound and they don't think about it. That's just mm. just kind of who they are, right? So they haven't thought about why they are who they are. They just are who they are. And so no matter who they record with, it's still going to sound like them because they have a very defined musical personality. I think it is very much like personality where there's mm. some people who have very bland personalities, you know, like, you've probably met a hundred people with the exact same personality or a thousand people with the exact same personality. And there's probably millions, hundreds of millions more with that same personality um, where they're completely interchangeable. And then you have other people who, for whatever reason, there's only one of them. Like you don't know anybody else that's like them and they didn't try to be that way. They just are mm-hmm. that way. Yeah. yeah. And uh, musically, it's, I think it's the same thing where there's just people like that, where you, if you're recording them, it's just going to sound like them without even trying to do anything other than just recording them. Yeah. I, I think they're the ones that are likely to get somewhere as well. You know, they, yeah, totally. They just, they just have that thing. I remember when I first met Andy James and he started playing guitar because um, he was he was in a, his first band. I did the first couple of records and then I did a solo album with him. And the second he started playing the guitar, I was like, he's going to make it. You know, yep. it was so effortlessly amazing. And his personality with the way he came with it as well, I thought he's going to get there. You know, just knew. It's undeniable with some people. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's great to be able to have a studio and genuine talent comes in the door because a lot of the time it doesn't. And that's just part of having a studio really is you have to make the best of what comes in. And sometimes amazing talent comes in and it's just the, it's just the best thing ever. You know, what's funny, man, is some people say that talent doesn't exist. It's all hard work. And my thoughts my thoughts are you just haven't been around you just haven't been around a genius because if you have yeah if you've been around real talent then there's absolutely no denying it Mm -hmm. they have a a way in which they see the world as well it's different to um to someone who's sort of trying to spin all the plates of life they Mm -hmm. they are like well this is what i do and i'm gonna try and do this and survive and you just think yeah why not it's so easy to be discouraged if you have failed bands one after another and you're getting older you know andy was in a handful of bands and it wasn't happening and then all of a sudden boom he's in you know he's in five finger death punch yeah imagine if he quit yeah when i look at people like andy james that type my thoughts are well, if anybody should go all in, it should be you. Like whether or not it's working out at this point in time, like kind of back to one of the first things we talked about is would you tell your kid to go into music? Like if my kid was one of those types, I would, because if anyone should give it a shot, it's that type of person. Mm. Also for their own mental well-being, because they're going to be miserable doing anything else and they're going to absolutely hate their lives. But if anybody has a chance of it working out, it's that type, that type of person. And uh, so I feel like they should be encouraged totally. 
Yeah, definitely. If somebody's got the talent but not necessarily the conviction, that that can be frustrating. You know, I've, oh, I know yeah. a handful of people like that, and I think your time's not up yet. Don't 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 hang it up yet. Just keep the faith a little bit longer. You never know what's around the corner. Richie used to be a cradle. He's known in the band at the moment. He's he's such a good songwriter, amazing guitarist. You know, he could happen. Could happen Richard for him. Shaw. Le- yeah, lovely guy. Oh yeah, I've Brilliant. taken some lessons from you know, him. He's fucking awesome. Killer player, you know, yeah. just such a good songwriter. And no band, you know, it's like, what's next? At this point, I'm though, watching. <laughs> yeah, like the thing with him is all he needs to do is keep trying. Hmm. In yeah. my opinion, like uh, I, I know that like things can seem dark, but I know full well, because I took lessons from him, how good he is. And I just paid attention to what I know were his contributions on that Cradle record, Hmm. just because it's super obvious. That dude is good. And uh, all he needs to do is keep putting himself out there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's all anyone can do, isn't it? But, you know, it's like, it's just painful when when you see somebody who's that good and it's like you just got to get the right gig. You know, I'm cheering him from the from the sidelines all the time. Yeah. <laughs> but then when you do see someone get that gig, like Jeff Loomis um, finally landing an arch enemy. Yeah. And I know that he, you know, he had Nevermore, but like there was a long period of time there where his career was not doing too great. Yeah, yeah. One of the best guitar players on the planet, one of the best guitar players in metal history. And then after Nevermore, it's like, well, what's happening? Like he did some solo stuff. He did Conquering Dystopia. And like, there's always a core fan base for him, but like never anything that was, I guess, on par with his talent level and ability Mm -hmm. level, like something appropriate Mm -hmm. for someone of his ability or you know what he represents i guess but then eventually in his mid to late 40s arch enemy happens and there you go yeah i mean you know for years silosis saw her on this sort of like level plateau they weren't really hitting a mark and then josh got in in architects and i thought well earned you know really put some years in in architects, he's you know he's obviously out of the band now, but that that put him on the map, and now he's doing Silosis again, and Silosis is really doing well now. You know, on a really good tour at the moment, the album's great. So yeah, it's gonna be you know sometimes it's like this, and then that big step up, and you're away. Yeah, so totally. You just it's like you say, you know, you've got to be a survivor, um, and you just need that optimism and faith, really. Absolutely. Because, you know, if you if you do rely on plan B too much, there is no plan A, is there? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, exactly. Well, Scott, I think this is a good place to end it. I think that's a perfect full circle on the episode. But uh, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to hang out. It's been a been a pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate the uh, the opportunity to put the world to rights. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> the man. world and music world. <laughs> Yeah, anytime, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nice one, mate.